My name is Uttara. Welcome to the Keku Naoroji Book Award Ceremony. Before we begin, a little bit about the Himalayan Club. The Himalayan Club's inaugural meeting was held in Delhi in February 1928 under the chairmanship of Field Marshal Sir William Birdwood, the club's first president. It is not widely known that a Himalayan Club was proposed as early as 1866 by W. H. Johnson of the Survey of India. and f drew of the asiatic society of bengal nothing came of it then but in 1884 douglas freshfield writing in the alpine journal suggested that knowledge of the himalaya might be extended by the establishment of a club prepared to publish narratives of science and adventure the himalayan club is now in its 93rd year of existence and it continues to strive to fulfill this vision as trevor braham said in 2008 My advice today to all who love the mountains is don't hesitate to apply for membership of the club your love could grow into a passion clubs are meeting points for diverse groups of people possessing similar ideas and interests enabling them to widen their acquaintances their knowledge and their ambitions as a member of the himalayan club keeping in close touch with it is very worthwhile and even more so by rendering whatever service one feels able to contribute it should be borne in mind that the club's objectives are not confined exclusively to mountain climbing but to a much wider range of interests and activities relating to the mountain world and its environment yielding rewards and demanding responsibilities keku naoroji was born in karachi on 5th september 1915 He was a man of the mountains with deep wellsprings of character and inner strength. Keku became one of the pillars of the Himalayan Club and was its president from 1986 to 1992. He joined the Himalayan Club in 1950, a relationship Keku was to enjoy immensely for the next 50 years. When the Himalayan Club moved its headquarters to Mumbai, Keku was its first secretary in 1971. its vice president from 1983 to 85 and for 7 years thereafter the president of the club he took his responsibilities of helping to strengthen and consolidate club ac- club activities seriously and his business experience enabled him to bring a very pragmatic and sound sense to all the committee dealings in 1952 keku spent 11 weeks in central gadwal and his personal diary of this trip as well as the account of his other major trip to the himalaya in 1958 to sikkim formed the subject matter of a book himalayan vignettes keku naroji passed away quietly on 17th december 2003 in 2005 the himalayan club in association with the naroji family and godrej industries set up a book award for the best literature on the himalaya published during the year in his memory This book award instituted in Keku's name is for a book relating to different aspects of the Himalaya such as mountains mountaineering people culture environment politics and any other related topic This year despite the covid-19 pandemic there were a formidable 12 excellent books shortlisted for the award our highest number yet It is my pleasure to introduce our special guest Dr. Feroza Godrej to present this year's Keku Naroji Award for Himalayan Literature. An art historian and chairperson of the Godrej Archives Council, Dr. Godrej is also the founder of the Simroza Art Gallery in Mumbai. Dr. Godrej wears many hats. She is a member of the Apex Committee of the National Gallery of Modern Art. the chairperson of the museum society of bombay and president emeritus of the national society of the friends of the trees she is also a trustee of the dr bahudaji lard museum and impact india foundation most importantly she has been an unflinching pillar of support to the himalayan club through the piroja godrej foundation thank you dr godrej for being with us and for virtually presenting this prestigious award good evening everyone It is really such a pleasure 
to be together with this wonderful group of friends from the Himalayan Club. In the year 2005, the Himalayan Club, in association with the Nauroji family and the Godridge Group of Companies, set up a book award which was titled the Keku Nauroji Book Award for Himalayan Literature, which was to be awarded for the best literature on the Himalayas written in that year. This book award, instituted in Keku's name, would be for a book published in the prescribed period and relating to some aspects of the Himalayas. The book could cover the mountains, mountaineering, the people of the Himalayas, culture, environment, politics, and any other related topics. We have always had a prestigious jury who makes a selection every year. And I'm really delighted we have, on behalf of the Nauroji and Godrich families here, to release this book for this year's award. The book is by none other than Stephen Alter, titled Wild Himalaya, with the subtitle of a natural history of the greatest mountain range on earth. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of all of us present here this evening for a virtual release of this book. And Stephen, our sincerest congratulations to you. Rishad Nauroji joins me as well. He is an old friend of yours and of course our beloved Keku Nauroji's son. And Rishad himself is an avid mountaineer, a trekker and a wildlife enthusiast himself. So congratulations, Stephen, on behalf of all of us for this wonderful book that you have written. I would now like to introduce this year's jury members. Stephen Goodwin is a mountaineer and journalist. After a career as a political reporter on The Times and The Independent, he quit the surreal Westminster village for a real village in Cumbria, UK. From there, for 10 years, from 2004 to 2013, he edited the prestigious Alpine Journal. He is also the author of three mountain guide books. In 1998, Stephen reached the south summit of Everest, filing an award-winning diary to The Independent. He is still active as a climber and ski mountaineer. Rama Goyal is an avid mountain lover and has trekked Nepal and in the Indian Himalaya. When she is not thinking about the mountains, she is a freelance copy editor and economist who has worked with many national and international think tanks and organizations. She has been senior editor at the Oxford University Press, consulting editor for the Financial Express newspaper and a lecturer at St. Stephen's College and at the University of Delhi. Nandini Purandare loves the Himalaya and loves books. After having trekked and travelled in the Himalaya for over 40 years, she continues to find ways to stay connected. She edits the Himalayan Journal, actively participates in the working of the Himalayan Club and is part of juries like the Keku Nauroji and Baff Mountain Book Competitions. Importantly, Nandini is working with her colleague Deepa Balsavar towards creating an oral history archive of the climbing Sherpas of Darjeeling. I now invite Stephen Goodwin, the chairman of this year's jury, to read the jury statement on behalf of the jury. Hello, everybody. I'm Stephen Goodwin, speaking from Cumbria in uh, Northern England. And it's my pleasure and privilege to read to you the jury statement uh, for the 2020 Himalayan Club's Keku Neuroji Book Award. The uh, 2020 Keku Neuroji Award has been a long road for us three jury members. The COVID-19 pandemic caused protracted delays in book distribution, a minor inconvenience set against so much human tragedy, such that it became necessary to extend the ent entry period and the jury submission deadlines by several months. This resulted in what is probably a record number of 12 books to read. First of all, therefore, I would like to thank my jury colleagues, Nandini Purandari um, and Rama Goyal for their forbearance during the struggle to secure all the books and then their thoughtful consideration of each and every entry. 
we owe a big thank you to Mayor D'Souza at the Himalayan Club office for her hard work harrying all those publishers. What a pleasure it has been to have so much diverse writing about or set within the Himalaya to immerse ourselves in during the long periods of lockdowns and home isolation. The 12 entries range from gripping climbing narratives through rose tinted reminiscences to weighty scholarship on religion and Himalayan dynasties. How do you judge between a perilous near death descent from Nanga Parbat in winter, that's Elizabeth Revels to live, the tension between myth and reality in our understanding of the Himalaya, that's Ed Douglas's Himalaya, a human history, and the Himalaya and all its inhabitants, natural and human, coming alive in lyric prose, Stephen Alter's Wild Himalaya, a natural history of the greatest mountain range on earth, and that's amongst others. It is as if one had to choose between apples and oranges. But choose we must, looking to common factors, literary merit, a furthering of our understanding of the Himalaya, reader engagement, in short, well, a well-told story, page after page, that sings, we hope, with the voice of the mountains. Most of the entries had one or more of these qualities, but one book captivated us all. Wild Himalaya, an, a natural history of the greatest mountain range on earth by Stephen Alter, our choice as the winner of the 2020 Keku Doroji Award. Though Wild Himalaya is described in its subtitle as a natural history, it is anything but an academic tone and takes in a rich store of myth and creation stories, as well as the scientific. Stephen writes with the sensibility of a poet. Every page is touched with a certain beauty, though darkly so when he laments man's destructive impact on the Himalaya and the planet as a whole. He is adept at using the personal and particular to discuss the bigger issue. For example, a cloudburst overflowing the gutters of his Landauer home opens the way to reflections on global warming and the droughts, forest fires and floods that beset the Himalaya. Every page in this book is a reason why Himalayan wilderness is worth saving. As one jury member pointed out, Stephen's telling of mythology and oral histories that have tried to make sense of the world for centuries is absolutely matchless. These stories are representative of how it is perfectly possible to be an atheist and still place value on the mysteries, spiritual explanations and myths that abound in our rich cult culture. I love this balance. The most important element, apart from the amazing mythology based stories, are the stories of little known heroes of the wilderness, the conservationists and scientists doing their best to conserve bits and pieces of the natural Himalaya. Another jury member found Wild Himalaya to be a truly magical book. Personal memoir, travelogue, history, folklore, myths, legends, flora, fauna, forest, geography, orange, origins, <laughs> treks and climbs combined with little known stories in a lyrical style, bringing alive the Himalaya in a unique way through all its inhabitants and constituents. Rocks, stones, rivers, birds, butterflies, plants and trees, martens, goats, sheep and other animals, rhododendrons, blue poppies, all etc. The Himalaya belongs to all of them apart from we human beings. They are all players and stakeholders in the past, present and future of the Himalaya. Wild Himalaya reminds us of this fact. There is a sense that the author is deeply aware of the entire ecosystem around him in the Himalaya natural and human, and that the Himalaya is an intrinsic part of him, starting with his house, Oakville, where he lives in Landauer and the history associated with it. There are passages of wild Himalaya that weave a kind of enchantment. One chapter describes how the heroic legends of the Garwal are recited by village bards who accompany their story, telling with percussive beat of the Dol and Dalman a musical tradition known as Dal Saga, an ocean of drumming. It is, writes Stephen, an oral text, part of the ethereal soundscape of the Himalaya. This is lyric prose of a high order, 
Stephen Alter and his Indian publisher, the Aleph Book Company, are to be congratulated on this remarkable addition to the literature of the Himalaya. Thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to introduce this year's winner of the Keku Nauroji Award for Mountain Literature, Stephen Alter. Stephen Alter is the author of more than 20 books of fiction and non-fiction. He was born in Masuri, Uttarakhand, and much of his writing focuses on the Himalayan range. Wild Himalaya, a natural history of the greatest mountain range on earth, is his most recent work of non-fiction. It received the 2020 Bath Mountain Book Award in the Mountain Environment and Natural History category, and now the Keku Nauroji Award. Stephen Alter's Becoming a Mountain, Himalayan Journeys in Search of the Sacred and the Sublime received the Keku Naroji Award for Himalayan Literature just a few years ago. He has written extensively on natural history, folklore and mountain culture, and particularly in his travel memoir, Sacred Waters, a pilgrimage to the many sources of the Ganga. Educated at Woodstock School and Wesleyan University, Stephen has taught at the American University in Cairo, Egypt, where he was director of the writing program for seven years. Following this, he was writer in residence at MIT for 10 years, where he taught courses on creative writing. Among the honors he has received are fellowships to the Guggenheim Foundation, the Fulbright Program, the East West Center in Hawaii, and the Baff Center for Mountain Culture. Stephen Alter is also the founding director of the Missouri Mountain Festival. Congratulations, Stephen. I'm sure we are all excited to hear you read from Wild Himalaya. Greetings from Los Angeles. Uh, it's a real delight and a pleasure and an honor uh, that Wild Himalaya has received the uh, Keku Naurochi Book Award for 2021. And I'm, I'm grateful to everyone. I'm grateful to the Himalayan Club uh, for sponsoring this award. Uh, I'm grateful to the jury, uh, each of whom I know from having served on the jury in previous years. Uh, Nandini Burandre, Rama Goyal, and Steve Goodwin. So my thanks to each of you. I know how much work goes into uh, making the selection and all of the hard reading that it takes, so I'm, I'm most grateful to you. I'm also extremely grateful to uh, Feroza Godridge for her kind words uh, at this time, uh, and uh, it's, it's of course a delight. I wish I could be in Mumbai uh, and be speaking to you directly, uh, but uh, my iPhone will have to uh, serve that purpose at the moment. Uh, as I was thinking about what I should say, uh, other than thank you, uh, is uh, the, the, the immediate thought I had was that perhaps I should uh, show uh, photographs of the different places, the different mountains, uh, the wonderful, spectacular uh, scenery of the Himalaya that uh, is very much a part of my book. And at the same time, I'd, I'd given talks like that quite often over the last couple of years since the book was published, and I thought to myself, I need to do something different. So it occurred to me that maybe what I should talk to you about today, and I, I promise not to take too much time, I promise not to belabor uh, any of the points, but I thought I would talk to you about what may seem to be the most boring uh, part of my book or any book, which is the bibliography. But I think the bibliography is something that it's very important for us to focus on because I think we all recognize that there is no book that is created without other books. And when it comes to Himalayan literature, uh, anyone who writes about the Himalaya draws on a vast library of books that uh, have already been written. And I think we have to credit those authors, those texts uh, that each of us draws upon as we write uh, our own stories of the Himalaya. In my office uh, in Masuri, I have a, uh, a certain ritual that goes on when I'm working on my books. I have a couple of bookcases uh, to the right of my desk. One is a bookcase in which I keep 
adding and taking away books that I'm using uh, and researching from uh, while I'm writing the book. And it's a little bit, I often think of it as like tending a garden. There are some books that are perennials there. Uh, there are some books that are annuals. And there are some books that get weeded out over time. But that very much is very much a, a resource for the book uh, that I'm writing. There's also another bookcase uh, just a little bit further on uh, to my right, which I keep locked, in which I keep those books which I think are the most valuable, uh, books that I don't want uh, stolen. At this point, I'll, I'll make a confession. Several years ago, uh, when I was serving on the jury of the Keku Naoroji uh, Book Award, uh, I had been sent uh, a large packet of eight or ten books. Uh, Wilma had packaged them up and sent them to Missouri and I'd received them and I'd put them on the one side of my desk uh, awaiting uh, the opportunity to start reading through those. And at that time there was a, an unusual, somewhat eccentric gentleman in Missouri who had decided that reading was his passion. And he would visit some of our homes from time to time, unannounced, uh, and would often just sort of walk in and pick up whatever books caught his eye and uh, take them away. And uh, as it happened, I was out of the house one day and uh, he came in and there was this stack of 10 books uh, for the uh, Keiku Naoroji Award. And uh, my friend picked them up and took them home. And when I came back to my study, I suddenly panicked because I thought to myself, where have these all gone? And in fact, uh, they had been taken by my friend. So I immediately jumped on my motorcycle, ran across and retrieved the books at that time. Uh, books are something that uh, I think are so important to, to all of us. And I think that what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the different kinds of books, some of the authors, some of the titles that have influenced uh, Wild Himalaya. And I'll uh, begin with uh, a couple of books that may be unfamiliar and then some others that are uh, probably old favorites for many of us. Wild Himalaya has a subtitle, A Natural History of the Greatest Mountain Range on Earth. Uh, it's a subtitle that my, my publishers suggested. Uh, it, it has a little bit of hyperbole on it. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the important part for me is the natural history, because a lot of my writing is nature writing, uh, writing about uh, the natural world, whether it be uh, the geology, uh, the plant life, the insect life, uh, mammals, uh, and other forms of life uh, in the Himalaya. Uh, and I look at the Himalaya often as a living landscape. Well, one of the books that influenced me many years ago and has stayed with me uh, over the years is Peter Mathiasen's The Snow Leopard, uh, which is a book I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. It's a book that combines uh, sort of spiritual uh, meditations, thoughts, uh, observations with a very vivid and uh, uh, immediate sense of the mountain landscape uh, where he's traveling. And it's a book that when I read it uh, perhaps 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, for the first time, it influenced me greatly and I thought to myself, this is the kind of book that I would love to write. Um, it was interesting that in that book, of course, he travels with uh, the uh, field zoologist uh, George Schaller, who is studying the snow leopard, but also the prey species, the bharal, uh, in uh, a remote part of Nepal. And uh, Peter Mathiasen refers to uh, George Schaller just by his initials, G.S. And G.S. Came, comes across as this very hard-nosed, uh, slightly cranky, uh, but uh, totally committed scientist who is on a uh, quest for uh, knowledge about these high-altitude species. Whereas uh, Mathiasen is there uh, he's grieving for a wife that he's just lost. Uh, he's very much a Zen Buddhist. And so the mountains have a very different kind of quality uh, for, for him as an observer. Uh, the interesting thing was that uh, maybe 10, 15 years later, I picked up one of George Schaller's books, which is called uh, Stones of Silence, 
and uh, it's a wonderful book. It, it talks about his scientific research, but in, in a sense it is a memoir. And what, what's fascinating about the book is that if you read it in conjunction with Matthiasson's The Snow Leopard, you get a sense of these two personalities, these two men who are up in the high Himalaya uh, for different reasons, but some shared uh, objectives as well. And Schaller doesn't come across perhaps as uh, a, a cold-blooded scientist. In fact, he comes across as a very thoughtful uh, a man who is full of reflections uh, and uh, he talks about his own experiences um, as uh, a scientist confronting those mysteries of the natural world uh, that somehow can't be quantified or can't be described in ordinary scientific terms. So reading those two books together inspired me a great deal. Um, when I began working on Wild Himalaya, one of the first books that I picked up was uh, D. N. Wadia's uh, Indian Geology, or The Geology of India. And uh, it's a book that uh, looks forbidding. I mean, it's a fat textbook. Uh, it's been uh, prescribed in colleges for uh, almost a hundred years, uh, and it was first published, I think, in 1916 or 17. And, and I thought to myself, well, I'm just going to pick and choose from this book and see what see what it contains. But the fascinating thing about Dian Wadia's book is that it is a wonderful narrative. Uh, and he has uh, a terrific skill as, as a writer. He uses metaphors uh, that bring together uh, and, and bring to life the geology of the Himalaya. He spent a great deal of time in Kashmir uh, studying the uh, different strata uh, of uh, rock uh, in the Himalaya, and uh, he's able to tell the story of creation, the creation of these mountains, the, the story of orogeny, uh, the formation of the Himalaya in a vivid, uh, absolutely uh, gripping uh, narrative, uh, and with language that really sings uh, on the page. Uh, Dian Badia is, is perhaps one of the most unlikely writers uh, that I encountered when it came to uh, writing about the Himalaya. He was born in uh, Surat, in Gujarat, uh, at sea level, and he just happened by accident to get a job at a college in Jammu, and that uh, sparked his interest in the Himalaya. So um, Dian Wadia's uh, scientific perspective, but this literary voice, uh, was something that I found uh, extremely uh, inspirational. In addition to the geology of the Himalaya, the formation of the mountains, I also uh, read a large number of books about the different forms of life that exist in the Himalaya, uh, whether it was the plant life uh, and the early uh, plant hunters, as they were called, who traveled uh, to different parts of the Himalaya, uh, people like J.D. Hooker, who uh, studied the rhododendrons of Sikkim, or uh, Frank Kingdon Ward, who's famous for uh, popularizing the blue poppy, or the Himalayan uh, blue poppy. Each of these writers, each of these books, uh, was something that I drew stories from. Uh, I referred to uh, the, uh, the factual elements of it as well, but there was an element of the uh, sort of personal narrative in each of those uh, writers that, that fascinated me uh, on, on many different levels. Um, when it came to bird life, uh, there were a number of sources. Uh, Salim Ali's uh, books, um, his books on uh, the birds of uh, Sikkim, uh, his work on uh, the Northeast. He was one of the first ornithologists to go into Arunachal Pradesh and uh, describe a number of species uh, that are either endemic there or are uh, found in uh, profusion in those particular areas of the Himalaya. Um, and Salim Ali, I think, is, is a writer that, again, I would point to as, as someone who is a scientist first, but nevertheless, he is a storyteller too. And if you read the descriptions of uh, the birds that he uh, is uh, 
referring to in his books, whether it be the blood pheasant, uh, whether it be the whistling thrush, whether it be the uh, gray winged blackbird, whatever it may be, he will tell you a story about that species. He's not just going to tell you what color it is, uh, what its call is like, but he will give you a sense of how this bird uh, fits into the larger scheme of uh, nature. Uh, I think that with uh, these uh, natural history stories, uh, there is also a story of exploration. And exploration uh, takes many different forms. Uh, in many cases, it is scientific exploration. Someone like Hooker uh, was going to areas that very few people had visited before, uh, very few Europeans had visited before, and he was exploring the natural history of that region. But exploration also takes, of course, as we know, with the Himalayan Club, takes the form of uh, mountaineering, uh, expeditions that are taken to uh, peaks that uh, have never been climbed before, regions that have never really been mapped before. And uh, those stories, which uh, I think I grew up on, and many of us, I think, uh, were inspired by those early on, the books uh, from the sort of what is often called the golden age of British mountaineering, uh, Shipton's accounts of uh, the Nanda Devi Sanctuary, uh, with Bill Tillman, Bill Tillman's own uh, particular narrative. Those are wonderful parallel narratives uh, going on uh, at the same time. And then Frank Smythe, who uh, in many ways I consider of the three writers, as a writer he was uh, perhaps uh, head and shoulders above the others, though uh, there are people who I know uh, will disagree with me on that. But uh, Frank Smythe, I think, was able to combine exciting stories of mountaineering with uh, very clear, uh, precise observations of the natural history of that uh, region, wherever he was uh, climbing, wherever he was camped, uh, for instance, in the Valley of Flowers in particular, where he talks about the botany of that region uh, side by side uh, with telling stories of climbing peaks like Ratavan uh, and other uh, peaks like Kamath as well. Um, I think the story of exploration is something that comes through from many, many different sources. And if I look at my bookshelf, uh, some of the titles that stand out are books by Harish Kapadia. Uh, I have a whole uh, collection of those, and Harish is one of those people who uh, goes where others fear to tread. Uh, he's, he's a great contemporary explorer, and I'm always fascinated by the, the valleys, uh, the destinations that he finds uh, that haven't yet been explored. Um, there are wonderful books by uh, writers like Wade Davis, uh, Into the Silence. Uh, that's a book, for instance, I, I was, it was recommended to me by a uh, senior member of the Himalayan Club, Dorji Latu, when I was visiting him in uh, Darjeeling. And Dorji told me, you must go and, and read this book uh, on the early Everest expedition. So I immediately went up to the, uh, I think it's the Oxford bookstore on Chaurasana and Darjeeling and bought a copy of Wade Davis's Into the Silence. And it uh, transported me back in time. Uh, it took me uh, to the north uh, face and the north approaches of Everest. Uh, and of course, the, the mysterious and uh, tragic story of Mallory uh, and his quest uh, for the summit of Everest. Speaking of exploration, uh, one of the real pleasures of having served on the jury of the Keiku Naroji Award uh, for uh, several years was that it gave me an opportunity to read uh, some books that I might ordinarily not have had a chance to read uh, living in India. And uh, a number of the uh, winners of the Geku Nauruji Award in previous years are books that I have on my shelf uh, uh, and that I refer to uh, in um, Wild Himalaya as well. I think of, uh, of course, to begin with Bernadette MacDonald's books about uh, exploration. I think the first book of hers that I read was Brotherhood of the Rope, uh, which is a wonderful account of uh, Charlie Houston's uh, career uh, and uh, some some terrifying moments on K2 as well as other 
other peaks that he climbed. Um, there are her stories of uh, the Polish mountaineering in uh, Freedom Climbers, and then most recently, uh, Winter 8000, which uh, takes on the subject of climbing uh, the 8,000 meter peaks uh, in winter. All of them gripping stories, and Bernadette has a way of uh, distilling uh, those mountaineering experiences into uh, a really fast-paced uh, narrative, but one that remains authentic uh, to the experience of mountaineering itself. And she, she is able to maintain that balance. It becomes a thriller, uh, but it's also a thriller that is totally grounded in facts, uh, interviews, uh, and her own uh, research on, on many different levels. Um, there are uh, other books about uh, exploration uh, that I've referred to uh, a number of times, uh, two, two uh, that uh, are winners of the Keiku Noroji Award. One is uh, um, Jim Perrin's book on Shipton and Tillman. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful story. He, he obviously has a very uh, intimate understanding of uh, the, the dynamic between these two very different men. Uh, and, and one of the great joys of that book actually was reading the footnotes because it's in the footnotes that Jim Perrin sort of lets loose and uh, makes uh, comments uh, sort of on the side that uh, illuminate uh, many of the moments uh, in the book itself. Uh, the other book that I, I thoroughly enjoyed was Tony Smythe's uh, My Father Frank, about Frank Smythe. Uh, and it was very much a personal uh, biography, but a, a bi he, he treads a very interesting line between uh, writing about his father uh, from a very personal perspective, but then also distancing himself and being able to uh, look at his father as uh, as a famous mountaineer, as a famous writer, uh, with all of his uh, flaws uh, and his faults, as well as his, uh, you know, great contributions uh, to Himalayan exploration. Um, it, it's interesting uh, there, during the reading there were these kinds of books which were wonderful, uh, which kept my interest. Uh, there were other ones that we would joke about where we 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 said at one point, I think, that we needed supplemental oxygen to get through uh, some of those uh, titles. I won't mention which those are. Um, but I think that one of the things that uh, is, is so interesting about the Keiku Naoroji Award, focusing on Himalayan literature, is that you get different aspects of the Himalaya uh, in uh, a one particular year. There may be nothing but books about exploration, and then another year you come up with uh, books that aren't about climbing necessarily or entirely about climbing, but other aspects of the Himalayan region. And I hope that in the future the Himalayan uh, literature that is evaluated and brought into this this award will will show the diversity of the Himalaya. Uh, one of these was Deborah Baker's uh, The Last Englishman. And uh, it's, it's a story primarily about J.B. Auden, uh, but uh, tells some of the history of the early uh, years of the Himalayan Club and Auden's own expeditions up into the Himalaya, particularly in, in Garhwal. It's uh, funny, I, when I get these books, I often uh, loan them. Uh, Bill Aitken, who is my guru on all, all things uh, Himalayan, uh, I, I often send across uh, a copy of a book that I've just uh, read uh, and we exchange uh, books from time to time. Bill is one of those wonderful people who always returns a book that you uh, loan to him. And uh, just the other day I picked up a copy of The Last Englishman uh, that I had loaned to Bill and I hadn't noticed, uh, this must have been a year or two ago that I sent it to him, uh, and I picked it up uh, and in the, on the flyleaf he had just, in very faint pencil, he had written um, witty, informative, profound. And next to each was a page number. And I was able to go to those page numbers. And certainly, uh, he had found something where the author was particularly witty, something that was particularly informative, and something that was particularly profound. And Bill, as, as a reader, uh, and as a writer, of course, in his books like the Nanda Devi Affair, has that great uh, precision of vision uh, he brings to it 
a, a spiritual understanding of the Himalaya, uh, and a, a wonderful sense of humor as well, uh, and mischief perhaps is perhaps the better word, where he will, uh, he will puncture uh, the, 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 the overblown uh, reputation of a particular climber or a writer as well. So uh, these are some of the books that, uh, in the course of judging the uh, Keiku Noroji Award, that have influenced me a great deal. Most of the books that are written about the Himalaya are written by people who are not necessarily from that region itself. Uh, often it's uh, European explorers, scientists, uh, or uh, writers from other parts of India who visit the Himalaya and write about the mountains. And on one level that's natural and it's understandable. But uh, as I was writing a Wild Himalaya, I was conscious of the fact that there were voices from the Himalaya itself, uh, that there were writers who uh, called this region home, and uh, their stories were something that fascinated me uh, particularly. Uh, one of the books that I um, have used uh, a number of times, uh, not just in Wild Himalaya, but in other uh, writing that I've done, is Shaker Bartok's um, book about uh, Nain Singh Ravat, Pandit Nain Singh Ravat. Uh, it's called Asia Ke Par, uh, and it reproduces uh, some of uh, Nain Singh's uh, own writing and his descriptions of the journeys that he took into Tibet. Uh, and it uh, brings to life that period of exploration and surveying uh, through the eyes of someone who uh, was born in the Himalaya, grew up in the Himalaya, belonged to the Himalaya. Um, the other writers, uh, though they may have been uh, translators or people that uh, ghost wrote uh, the books for them, but um, Tenzing Norgay's Tiger of the Snows uh, is, is again a wonderful account of uh, a, a young man growing up in uh, the border regions of Tibet and the Solokumbu Valley and then ultimately working his way up to being a, an elite mountaineer, uh, a Sherpa uh, who uh, sort of cross that boundary between uh, simply helping others climb and climbing himself. Uh, Antarke's uh, book, uh, on, which is titled Sherpa, and has, a, has an interesting, intriguing, and, and perhaps un, unsolved uh, authorship. Um, it, it, uh, it was first published in French uh, and supposedly uh, dictated to someone named Basil Norton uh, in uh, Darjeeling, though, as far as I know, we haven't been able to figure out who Basil Norton is. But nevertheless, in Antarctica's book, at uh, many points, you get uh, a, a very authentic, um, uh, clear description of his own personal life uh, before he became a climber. And of course, he, he came to fame uh, because he was with Maurice Herzog on uh, Annapurna. Uh, and then was on many of the Everest expeditions as well. One of the books that I, I found fascinating was Chandrapapa Aitwal's uh, book called Mountains Are Calling. It's a small book uh, that hasn't been well publicized, but she is uh, one of um, India's uh, most accomplished uh, women climbers, and she uh, comes from the mountain region in uh, northeastern Kumao. Uh, she's from a, a migrant community uh, and she writes about herself as a young girl uh, herding uh, goats and sheep up in the border regions and crossing over into parts of Nepal and then into Tibet. Uh, and then only really at the age of 40 does she become a mountaineer uh, and someone has encouraged her to do that. And so she writes about that, uh, that, that sort of um, two sides of her life one which is a very uh, simple rural uh, life as a migrant uh, in that area, and then one uh, as a mountaineer, someone who is climbing with other elite mountaineers uh, on uh, expeditions. Finally, what I'd like to end with is to recognize also those books. I think of them as books, though they may not have been published, where there is a storehouse of knowledge. There is a 
a wealth of stories uh, that come out of an oral tradition. One of my dear friends, Surinder Pundir uh, from Jaunpur, uh, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, uh, was someone that I always enjoyed sitting with because uh, Pundirji would sit and tell me stories about the uh, deities, uh, the folklore, uh, the folk songs of uh, his part of the Himalaya. And uh, through those stories, through his sort of infectious uh, sense of curiosity and uh, humor as well, uh, I, I was able to understand certain aspects of the mountains that would never have come out in, in a book uh, necessarily. And the other uh, person who has been a great inspiration for me and uh, who I uh, call a very dear friend uh, is uh, Tataram uh, Barohit, uh, who is a folklorist, uh, studied folk theater in Garhwal and uh, traveling with Barohit uh, in uh, Garhwal is, 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 is like being uh, part of a, an epic story that goes on and on and on. He's an expert on the Pandav Lila or the Mahabharat uh, recitations in the mountains and as uh, he and I have traveled uh, to different parts of Garhwal or sat together uh, in Missouri, uh, I've always enjoyed listening to the stories that he tells, and those stories to me are as vivid uh, as many of the accounts that uh, I've mentioned before, the published accounts, and uh, I uh, draw upon those in Wild Himalaya as well. So these are some of the sources. These are, this is the library of Himalayan literature uh, that I have drawn from uh, that I want to acknowledge uh, in uh, this particular context. The Wild Himalaya itself is the book uh, that is receiving uh, the Keku Naroji Award. It is a book that stands upon so many other books. Uh, and I am grateful to those authors to those storytellers, to those researchers, for providing me with uh, the material uh, that has gone into this book. So once again, my thanks uh, to the uh, organizers of the Keiku Naoroji Award, uh, to the Himalayan Club, to the Godridge family, uh, and to the jury as well. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for that riveting talk on the different books that made your book. On behalf of the Himalayan Club, I would also like to thank Dr. Godridge, the jury, Stephen Alter, and the team that worked to make this event possible. After a couple of successful writing workshops, the Himalayan Club will shortly conduct a photography workshop. Please do get in touch with us for registration and details. See you at our next event. Until then, take care and stay safe.